Government focuses on bougainville, forestry and public service. Condolences flow in for Sir Makere Morauta. And ombudsman partners to address water issues. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Sunday's news. The wife and son of former Prime Minister Sir Makera Morata have announced the passing of their late husband and father. Lady Rosalind Morata in a statement says Sir Makera died peacefully in Brisbane yesterday. The member from Mosby Northwest was sick for a long time and died from illness while receiving treatment in Australia. Sir Makera was born in 1946 in Kukipi village, Malalawa district of Gulf province. He became prime minister in 1990 to 2002 and retired from politics in 2012. In 2017, Sir Makera returned to politics and won the seat for Moresby Northwest Electorate. We have a special report on the life of Sir Makera that will be aired in our a Closer Look segment later on in the bulletin. Opposition leader Belden Nama says he will miss Sir Makera's friendship and guidance and have passed on his condolences to Lady Roslyn and the children. A statement from the opposition leader highlights few development steps Sir Makera took in creating reforms for Papua New Guinea. This includes the introduction of the integrity of political parties and candidates' law to stabilize politics. In concluding, Nama says PNG has lost a very colorful senior statements and statesmen and renowned reformist. Meanwhile, Acting Chief Secretary Isaac Lupari on behalf of the Department of Prime Minister and the NEC also conveyed their sympathies to Lady Roslyn and the Morauta family. Acting Secretary Lupari also in a statement described Sir Makere as an eminent reformist and says his legacy will live on. The Ombudsman Commission will be working closely with the Department of Lands and Physical Planning and the National Capital District Commission under its anti-discriminatory function to ensure that people's rights are not abused during eviction exercise throughout the city. This comes after the Commission's recent meeting with the NCD Governor and the Land Secretary offering to assist in providing mediation with illegal squatters on state land following a front-page post Courier article last week. The chief ombudsman in a statement whilst commending the initiative by the Lens Department to free up state land for proper planning said the commission is not against the initiative but wants to ensure that the people's rights are not abused. Chief Ombudsman Pagan states that pursuant to the five national goals and directives principles as set out in the preamble to the constitution, the government has the duty to take into account the people's welfare despite them being illegal settlers. He said currently PNG has no established Human Rights Office and that the Ombudsman Commission is the only office in the country now that deals with human rights issues as set out under Section 218B of the Constitution. Chief Ombudsman Pagan urges the Lens Department and the NCD Governor to resettle people who are going to be affected during the revamping exercise. The governor in response has assured the commission that there will be no eviction and that NCDC and the Department of Lands are ready to work together to address the squatter issues operation of funds belonging to the Divine Word University. Florence Iregi Castro Sale from Tinga Nalom village in Kokopo district is alleged to have stolen over 400,000 kina from Divine Word University whilst working as a data entry officer. It is alleged that Castro Sale deliberately posted duplicated claims to different bank accounts instead of the account for tuition fee refunds by rearranging initials, first name and surname of students back to France and vice versa to avoid match in the system. She has been charged with 39 counts of stealing by false pretense and misappropriating 473,587 kina. Police further allege that after stealing the money, she cashed 111 checks and walked away with the money. 
St. John Ambulance PNG is calling for a focus on road safety this festive season. This comes after the ambulance service has had to respond and attend to 19 serious cases involving motor vehicles in the last 19 days since the start of December. All 19 incidents have left at least 46 people requiring treatment and transport to hospital and six deaths. Drivers and passengers are urged to slow down, drive according to the road conditions and wear seat belts at all times. Abiding by simple safety measures will decrease the chances of more fatal accidents this festive season. And National MTV News continues with more after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back. A habitual bag snatcher and petty criminal who hangs out at Port Moresby's Cocky bus stop was apprehended by volunteers at Cocky Community Cop Shop. The suspect was picked up this morning and taken into custody at the Badili police station cells. Police say he is known to prey on women who travel on PMV buses that stop over at the Cocky bus stop. His apprehension is a signal to other petty criminals to cut down on snatching bags and other personal items from other citizens, especially especially women and girls. City Pharmacy Limited Group is going beyond just purchasing from local farmers. They're extending that relationship to more than just purchasing. They're now providing free of charge technical advice, among other help to farmers. This is to ensure their local food suppliers are supplying them the best. A 40-minute drive outside Port Moresby along the Maggi Highway is the Bange Fresh Produce Farm. This farm belongs to Joseph Wamina and his wife Pauline. The farm grows mainly popo and lettuce to supply to Stop and Shop and NCS. On Friday, the City Pharmacy Group's agriculture specialists pay the visit to the farm to inspect the farm and see how they can help address some of the farm's challenges. While speaking with the CPL team, Joseph shared the story of how they went into specialized farming. Joseph and Pauline initially started farming lettuce and pak choy in 2012 at their block at Buswara, 9 Mile. Joseph had just graduated from the University of Papua New Guinea with a bachelor's degree in computer science, but saw job seeking as a waste of time. Previously, we, me and my wife, we started. Yeah. We, ourselves, we, we, we farming. We had to uh, the nursery, uh, prepare land preparation, mm. harvesting to the market and then back. We like, that time we don't have any airport. Yeah, yeah. Nine we were just walking. Trucks. We were just walking. We should be able to jump on PMV. From nine mile. Yeah. Nine mile. From Buswara up to nine mile. Yeah. And then we have to take the bus down to Gorens, mm. to our market, and then get the PMV. Uh, get the PMV back to uh, Buswara, and then we go back and forth like this. In 2017, they moved here after purchasing the state land for 1.2 million kina through a bank loan. Joseph said they wouldn't have purchased this land if it wasn't for CPL's partnership, allowing them to have a steady cash flow. The bank showed that definitely uh, the payments coming through CPL into our own, like consistently, yeah, daily. Like normally we used to produce uh, uh, ladies and factory, you know, daily. It is 100 kilos, let this back to everybody is going and then they should be, you can produce, you can get this kind of kind of money, so. They find us like, to get you, you, you are farmers and they don't need to go into business, so. they just find this area, they have the money. Yeah. Bangat Fresh Produce now employs 36 employees. The Waminas constantly do research and trials new things to improve the quality of the food they produce. Seeing this commitment and the investment made, CPL has stepped in to listen to their challenges and help with expert advice. CPL's agriculture specialist Isabella Amoa and Pierre Dobunaba took the time inspecting all the plots at the farm and even the nursery. In the process, giving tips to the farm workers. The wet season hasn't been good for the lettuce and bok choy with suggestions to help with the drainage as well. RJ Patel, who leads the CPL team, said Joseph is the first farmer they are visiting. They will visit all local farmers in central province and see how they can help produce quality food for stop and shop. Shamin Poreambeb, National MTV News. 
And turning over to the region, reports of widespread destruction are coming in from remote areas of Fiji after Cyclone Yasa pummeled the islands as a Category 5 superstorm. Thousands of people are still in the evacuation centres and the death toll stands at four, but there are fears it will rise. Fiji's Prime Minister visiting devastated communities. Surveying the damage from Cyclone Yasa and its 340 km an hour winds and bringing a message of resilience. We will prove ourselves stronger than Yasa. Two days after Yasa, a clearer picture is emerging. Northern Fiji suffered a direct hit. Power is out and homes have been flattened. This school was completely destroyed. Four people have died, but that number is expected to rise as remote areas are reached. 16,000 people remain in evacuation centres. It's estimated about 100,000 were in Yasa's direct path. We are likely looking at hundreds of millions of dollars in damages. Floodings caused extensive damage. Farmers in Savu Savu told News Hub they've lost much of their crop. Up in the bush, there's a lot of damage there. Most of the trees have come down. Aid organisations are reporting widespread destruction, with food parcels on the way. Urgent supplies like water and sanitation kits um, and things like um, education supplies so that the schools will be able to get back up and running. And our Ministry of Foreign Affairs has also sent aid and a Defence Force plane for aerial surveys. We hope to get some early aerial imagery um, very soon, actually. It'll be, it'll be later today. After Winston in 2016 and now Yasa, two of the Pacific's worst cyclones have hit in just the last four years. Fiji's PM is blaming climate change. Due to climate change, these storms may be getting stronger, but they will never be stronger than we are. Staring down a costly cleanup, but showing the Fijian spirits stronger than even the most powerful storm. Two Americans are now dying from COVID-19 every minute as the country's death toll approaches a staggering 320,000. More than 24 hours ago, 3,270 people died, but hope has arrived with the second vaccine just given the green light. Across America, they are cheering the rollout of the vaccine. Three, two, one, vaccine! As it arrives in hospitals and care homes across the nation. And the medical community is hoping that being vaccinated is seen as a patriotic duty in a country that has lost over 300,000 people to the virus. The Vice President Mike Pence, who leads the Coronavirus Task Force, had his inoculation this morning. It was broadcast live on breakfast TV shows, an attempt to reassure skeptical Americans that it's safe. The American people can be confident. We have one, and perhaps within hours, two safe and effective coronavirus vaccines for you and for your family. The vice president was referring there to the new vaccine that is coming off production lines, manufactured by Moderna. It is the second weapon to combat COVID, joining the Pfizer-BioNTech breakthrough. And significantly, this one doesn't need to be kept at ultra-cold temperatures. I'm very confident that these vaccines are game changers that a year from today, the world doesn't have to be like it looks now. And uh, what we have to do is help people get to that point. Don't get infected now. As we say at our place, stop swapping air. All of these patients throughout this section of the ER have COVID. The pressure is currently most acute in California, where the healthcare system is close to collapse and where hospitals are now treating COVID patients in tents built in adjacent car parks. And as ITV News has witnessed, the crisis is also amplifying the existing health care disparities amongst minority communities right across America. Joe Biden's stated goal still remains 100 million vaccinations within the first 100 days of his administration. And even with two vaccines now being produced, that remains a formidable logistical challenge. When we return a closer look, we pay tribute to late Sir Makera Murata, former Prime Minister and member for Mosby Northwest, who lost his fight to cancer yesterday. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the news. Sir Mekera Morata's passing was announced late yesterday on social media. The former Prime Minister is the second to have passed away since Sir Bill Skate in 2006. Sir Mekera's life in the public sector began as a research officer with the Department of Labor. He later reformed the financial banking sector and strengthened the political party governance. The impact of his work is far reaching both here and in the Pacific. This is tonight's a closer look at the life of Sir Mekera Morauta, the former Prime Minister and current member for Mosby Northwest in the time of his passing. For many Papua New Guineans, Sir Mekere Morauta will be remembered as the straight-shooting politician and the reformist prime minister whose work came to be appreciated more than a decade later. Up until the 1990s, Mekere Morauta's public life was rather low-key. He thrived behind the scenes, helping to develop, shape and implement important government policies. He was the first graduate in economics from the University of Papua New Guinea and with it came important responsibilities, both for his people and the country. When I look back, I recall very clearly someone talking to me in 1979-80, Sir John Crawford, a famous Australian. He told me, or made a statement saying that Papua New Guinea's stand, standard of policy making and government public service was so high, the quality was so good so early in, the, in this nation's life. His challenge to me was, could those standards be sustained? Because possibly you couldn't better them. It's the task of sustaining a nation with those qualities was going to be our challenge. When I look back now, I find he was right. In 1971, he began a career in the public service as a research officer with the Department of Labor. A year later, he took up a job as economist in the Office of Economic Advisor. When Papua New Guinea became self-governing in 1973, the government of Chief Minister Michael Sumare sought out its best and brightest to help run the young democracy. At 27, Mekere Morauta was thrust into a position of power and responsibility when he was appointed Secretary for Finance, a post he held for nine years. He was always an important influencer in the banking and financial sector of Papua New Guinea. In 1983, he was appointed managing director of the Papua New Guinea Banking Corporation, an important PNG institution. He held the position for another nine years until his upward transition to a new job as the governor of the Bank of Papua New Guinea. It was in this short stint as central bank governor that he shot to prominence as an outspoken enemy of corruption that was infecting PNG government institutions. Sir Julius Chan was Prime Minister then and in a foreign documentary on corruption in Papua New Guinea, Mekere Morauta spoke out and was removed one year into the job. I think it would be fair for me to describe corruption as both systemic and systematic systemic because it has invaded the whole processes of policy making and decision making it has drowned the whole system so it's systemic it's systematic because it's organized the period from 1994 to 1997 were politically turbulent the international attention on government institutions and the corruption highlighted by key figures in Papua New Guinea, including Seme Kere, caused many Papua New Guineans to demand a change in leadership and management. 
the seeds had already been planted. In 1997, when the government of Sir Julius Chan opted to bring in South African mercenaries to end the Bougainville crisis, PNGDF Commander Brigadier General Jerry Singro called for the Prime Minister to step down and riots broke out. It was months before the elections and when Sir Julius was voted out of office, a new group of political leaders, including Sir Mekere Morauta, were voted in. For the next three years, the country faced deep economic trouble. The decade-long closure of the Bougainville mine, a severe drought and high unemployment and government institutions in desperate need for reform. This was the scenario in 1999 when Semekere took over from Bill Skate as Prime Minister. In the next three years, Semekere had the most impact on Papua New Guinea's political and economic future. You know, the country had been had been completely wrecked by just dreadful governance, um, and um, you look at the economic and social indicators, and it's quite clear that Papua New Guinea was on its knees. Um, he came straight in and instituted a whole series of reforms that. Um, changed the face of Papua New Guinea and sustained the economy and society right through um, to the end of uh, uh, the end of, la of last year. His, his reforms had very deep and very lasting um, effects. Part of the reason for that is that he was internationally renowned. And when the, the crunch came in 1999, he was able to call on um, friendly foreign governments, friendly international institutions, um, and expertise from all over the world to support uh, Papua New Guinea in that, that time of crisis. Um, he brought concessional finances to Papua New Guinea through loans from Australia, Japan, China, New Zealand, um, concessional lending from the World Bank and IMF, uh, the Asian Development Bank. And that is because of his international stature. In 2000, the Mekere government introduced sweeping reforms in the finance and banking sector. He introduced legislative reforms that strengthened the superannuation funds and banks, effectively eliminating much of the political interference that these institutions had long been burdened with. Through the reforms, Nest Fund and other super funds, which were on the brink of collapse, were revived and strengthened. We will remember Semekere for the strong political leadership that he displayed in 2000 for driving uh, superannuation reforms in Papua New Guinea. Uh, if he hadn't uh, intervened at the time, I think the funds who were laden with uh, problems, with deficiencies, uh, lack of governance, uh, strong political interference uh, would have been in a different state today. So to Sir Makere, uh, the superannuation in industry owes him a lot. As a proponent of um, implementing the reforms that Sir Makere instituted in 2000, the superannuation industry uh, is very strong uh, today. Uh, members, contributors to the funds, NAS Fund, uh, Number One Super, Common Trustee, uh, their prede predecessor organizations, uh, the National Provident Fund, Public Officers Superannuation Fund, and the Defense Force Retirement Fund, have strongly benefited from the governance uh, reforms that were part and parcel of the superannuation legislation. So we owe Sir McCary a lot for those reforms. In the political sphere, constitutional changes were made to strengthen political parties and other institutions of state. As Papua New Guineans come to grips with the void left by Sam McCary's passing, the impact of his decisions at the turn of this century will continue to be felt decades into the future. Uh, from a, a personal point of view, it was a, a wonderful experience uh, to work for him. Um, I know there are a lot of other Papua New Guineans who feel the same way and, um, you know, I hope he's um, 
he's recommended, he's remembered um, in the way that he deserves. And Chukai Sports is next. Huxley Lovai will join you after the break. Chukai Sports. Good evening and welcome to Chukai Sports. Port Mosby City Academy is one of the new teams taking part in the Southern Conference of the Women's National Soccer League. The team is a development vehicle for young female players who participate in the Port Mosby Soccer Association, exposing them to a higher standard of football. Despite losing their round three match against NCDFC, academy coach Miriam Lenta appreciates the opportunity given to the young team. It was a high-scoring affair in the Southern Conference of the Women's National Soccer League over the weekend, as NCDFC defeated a determined Port Mosby City Academy four goals to three. The lively encounter between the two teams made up mostly of youth players, so both sides playing attacking football building momentum and going for the win to kickstart their season. Uh, lately we've been working on all in the defensive area, so we are looking forward to building the players in the front line too also. But uh, we just need to work on a bit of our fitness. That's why we like him Lord Islam. Last one uh, 15 long games. Port Mosby City Academy coach Miriam Lenta wants her side to learn from their experience playing at the highest level, building towards their development as football players. For the Port Mosby Academy, it's a development side. So most of them are young girls. We have only, I think, two senior players running with them, just to give more confidence to the player. Every, every time, like, it's like only the men's. And now launching Lord Mary, we're looking like it's a good pathway, yeah, for 2023 World Cup. Yeah. I think we are the Pacific Queen, so this is where we should start and continue. Huxley Lovai, Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports continues with cricket and sailing after the break. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to international cricket. And there's good news for the Black Caps after Friday night's five-wicket win in the first T20 against Pakistan. The New Zealand side also welcomed back a host of frontliners for game two and three that could spell bad news for Pakistan. Performance, there's no room for him in games two and three as frontline seamers Trent Bolt, Kyle Jamison, and Tim Southey return. I know there's some absolute class players coming in, and it's going to be bloody hard to, you know, get back in again because the, the depth in the bowling is um, unbelievable at the moment. It's a similar situation in the batting department. While incumbent opener Tim Seifert top scored with 57 last night, Mark Chapman's 34 from 20 balls was equally important in the Black Caps' pursuit of 154. But like Duffy, the overflow of talent means there's no room for him for the remainder of the series either. And that's really healthy, I think, for New Zealand cricket on the whole and, and says a lot of really good things about our programs. Chapman makes way for Williamson, who will play for the first time since becoming a dad. It's great to be back in in the fold as a, as a player um, and catch up with some of the guys and try and build on some of the good work that they've been doing. So as the Black Caps fan base is growing, so too is the depth as they build towards next year's T20 World Team New Zealand is on track to make it two from two on the third day of the America's Cup World Series. It was the spectator boats that dominated the early proceedings on day three. A last-minute course change meant supporters found themselves in the middle of the course rather than around it. It delayed racing by over an hour, but that clearly didn't affect Team New Zealand. And they will take this regatta from Dean Barker and American Magic. In their first meeting with American Magic on day one, it was Dean Barker who got up over Peter Burling. And today's race was another classic battle. This duel between these two houses 
Brisbane is extraordinary. The Americans held the advantage for much of the race. Now taking a beautiful long one down the course here. More pressure, and that lead is stretched from 50 metres up to 200 with one jive into this bottom gate. But one mistake can flip the scales drastically, and with Burling having just taken the lead, Barker helped him extend it. And Dean Barker has had a shocker. Yeah, Absolute shocker. Touchdown by American Magic. From there, Team New Zealand's lead was unassailable. Meanwhile, it was another day to forget for Ineos Team UK, who came off the foils three times in their first up demolition by Luna Ross. Oh, they've turned fully around. They are stuck in the middle of the course, Phil. And their fortunes didn't improve in their second race of the day against American Magic. They are still full belly in the water right now. Once again, coming off the foils, offering little threat to Barker as the Americans cruise to victory. They make it four wins in this World Series. It will get no easier for the Brits, still searching for their first win. And that ends Chukai Sports. Helen will be back with the tonight's weather. Good night. Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus, with you always. A look at the weather forecast in the southern region. Fine weather with rain drizzles later in Port Moresby and Kerama. Fine weather with some afternoon showers in Dalru. Fine weather, though cloudy in Alatown's showers with some showers later in Popandita. In the Mamasa region, mostly fine though partly cloudy with afternoon showers developing in Lee. Morning showers then fine partly cloudy weather in Medang. A few showers then fine partly cloudy weather in Wewak and morning showers then fine cloudy weather in Vanimore. In the New Guinea Islands region, fine partly cloudy weather with afternoon showers likely in Lorengau. Mostly fine though partly cloudy with afternoon shower or two in Kaviang. Partly cloudy with afternoon showers in Kokopo and Rabaul. Cloudy with chances of rain showers and possible thunder in Kimbe and occasional rain showers and thunderstorms easing in Buka. In the Highlands region, morning fog clearing, then fine partly cloudy weather with afternoon showers in Mount Hagen. Morning fog clearing, then fine partly cloudy weather with evening showers and drizzles in Goroka and Kundiawa. And morning fog clearing to cloudy weather with occasional rain drizzles in Mendi and Wabag. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. And before we go, Prime Minister James Marape this afternoon announced the distribution of ministerial portfolios among the allocation of ministries. The Prime Minister will be in charge of Bougainville Affairs. Sam Basil is Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Commerce and Industry. Treasurer is Ian Ling Staki. Finance and Rural Development is Sir John Pundari. Rainbow Paita takes up National Planning and Monitoring. State Enterprises is William Duma. These are some of the ministries. While while making the announcement, the Prime Minister also said the government's priority areas are Bougainville, forestry and reforming the public service. And that's been the news, sport and weather from all of us here at MTV. Pleasant viewing and bye for now.